What's up, everybody? It's uh, Monday, December 22nd. It's the Monday Morning Analyst, the MMA, uh, episode four. Over the weekend, there was the Grapple at the Garden. This was on Sunday, uh, uh, an amateur wrestling event. I'll briefly discuss it. Um, there was some boxing. I didn't really get a chance to watch it, so I'm not going to pretend to make a big deal out of it. And I know there was some kickboxing results. I'll start feeding in kickboxing results and analysis in 2015, but I don't have a lot to get to today. The big one is going to be UFC Fight Night 58, Leo Demichita take on taking on CB, CB Dalloway. Jesus. Uh, of course, my name is Luke Thomas. Uh, follow me on Twitter at SBN Luke Thomas, and you can email me at luke.thomas at sbnation.com. Let's start with the big one, and then I'll end with the, uh, mon- the uh, Grapple at the Garden results. Uh, UFC Fight Night 58, I actually thought for a Fight Night event it was pretty good. Um, I thought that uh, I'd give it a six and a half, which again is not a bad score. You know, if, if Jones Cormier winds up being the most amazing fight ever, that'd be like a nine five. Uh, so giving it a six, six and a half is, I, I don't mean that to be in a derogatory way. I mean, if you're grading on a curve, uh, it would be higher, but six and a half is pretty good. Um, one little note about watching UFC events that I want to mention that I just haven't before, and I think a lot of people get angry at me, maybe rightfully so, about some of my criticisms about the lack of talent. Now, this one had some better talent, um, but uh, I think I've finally been – I didn't mean for it to be this way, but I've sort of been trained to watch um, UFC events. By the way, I want to make sure this thing is – Recorded properly. Here. Nope. Here we go. There we go. That should be better sound. Um, I think that uh, I've, I've been watching UFC events without realizing that I'm watching them like an expected boxing match. Which is to say, sometimes you get a great card like that Mayweather-Canelo card where Almost all four fights on the card are great. Certainly the co-main is great. And then another featured fight on the card. Um, but, you know, MMA always sort of prided itself on not building cards that way, that there was this bulk of material you could like. But I think because the UFC is trying to thin out their product intentionally, where they're trying to give you great main events, great co-main events, and then especially as they go international, just give you a lot of regional guys, some of, the, some of whom might wind up pushing through the ranks a lot won't. Um, but have a serviceable role as they're in these international countries. I think my brain has been trained to now watch that product like I was watching, a, like I'm watching a boxing product. Though it's not quite that far apart. These guys are better than some of the guys you might find on the undercard of a boxing event, where you might, you know, you won't get any amateurs, but you get four round fights as opposed to ten or twelve. Um, it's a, it's a, it's a much further drop off uh, in that in that sense. But I just mean, you know, a lot of my consternation about the quality issue. Is not that these guys aren't some of the more better prospects regionally. It's that I've gone from watching MMA circa 2008 and where you expect this load of, you know, high end MMA action to where I have a more boxing mentality, where, um, you know, not that I'm forgiving of the lack of quality, but that I've just sort of come to be resigned that there's going to be a main and a co main, and then the rest might be what it is. And I find that unfortunate because that's running headlong into my MMA idealism about cards being fuller, more impactful events. Uh, and maybe that's where some of my consternation comes from this new way of watching versus these old, undying beliefs about what cards should be. And maybe that should adjust. I don't know. You can make a case. Either way, um, card was not bad. Card was not bad by any stretch of imagination. Not great, but uh, okay. So, uh, kicking off, Vitor Miranda defeated Jake Collier um, via TKO. Sorry, I can barely read here. With like one second left in the round. Not not a whole lot to this bout. Miranda looked good. Finished him off rather nicely. Um, I think Collier was expecting to go to the – because Miranda had been sort of pacing him backwards. I think he was expecting to go to the middle, and he went upstairs with it, caught him clean, and basically finished him off with punches from there. Um, It's a fight-pass fight between two guys who I don't think have a a, a tremendous amount of upside. Um, But nevertheless, um, a good win for Miranda and a good way to kick off the show. Uh, Tim Means defeated Marcio uh, Alashange Jr. uh, via split decision 29-28, 28-29, 29-28. Tim Means – Fights up to competition or fights down to competition. He wound up getting away with this one, but I didn't find it particularly impressive. Um, 
Now we get to the sort of the more substantive parts of the card. Leandro Issa defeating Yuta Sasaki or Olka Sasaki, depending which one you want to use here with the neck crank. Um, I actually thought this was a really good... Uh, this fight was important because it showed you the real different kinds of jiu-jitsu that are out there. Now, Issa, for all his problems, you know, 1FC never die, but uh, Issa has what I think is just an incontestably more comprehensive jiu-jitsu game. And by that, I mean, I don't think he has more tricks up his sleeve or that he's got, you know, I know more ways to do a triangle choke, quote-unquote. What I mean is he just understands body mechanics. Jiu-jitsu, people think it's a series of techniques that you learn, and in some capacity, I suppose that it is, but it's really not. It's really physics. It's physics under a rule set, of course, but it's physics, it's biomechanics. Why does the body move a certain way? Why does it not? How do you attack it? How do you attack it when they defend certain things? Um, but it's really, it's that's there's no magic to it. There's no magic to it. There's no secret death touch. There's no one position that works that people can't, you know, uh, invariably just struggle in for hour upon hour. You have to learn the way in which the human body moves and the way in which people react and and how to um, how to examine these things and how to take advantage of openings and what openings are there and why they're there and how your body has to move around them or on top of them or crushing them or whatever the case may be. And Issa's relative to Sasaki, I mean, we're talking leagues of difference. And I'm not even just pointing to the resume, just the way in which, you know, Issa was like chair sitting and um, understanding how to pass and how to keep Sasaki on his back. And, and, and like Sasaki was doing things like you saw, he had that basically that he was trying to lock up a Darce from his back. You know, that's, that's, that's fun and that's cool. And, you know, you saw Issa's head turn purple and that'll work against lesser guys. The truth is, like, that's never going to work against really good guys. I'm not saying Issa's a world beater, but certainly in jiu-jitsu, he's a world beater. And so that's a real gimmicky game. It's just a real gimmicky game. Like, you're going to catch guys with it. It reminds me of some of these, like, Pancras guys who come and they have great leg locks, but they can't defend guard passing for S. You know what I mean? Um, it reminds me of that. It reminds me of that. So, like, I'm not saying Sasaki's a guy you're going to go in there and, you know, just lord your jiu-jitsu over him that he has no jiu-jitsu to speak of. But there are some guys that really focus in on, I don't know if it's even flashy as the word, but they think jiu-jitsu is just offense from any position. And it's not, you know, I know you got guys even in jiu-jitsu like that who are, you know, I, Majid Hage is like a world-class black belt. I don't mean to diminish him like that, but he's got this like baseball bat choke from side control, which is an unheard of. Most of the times when you see baseball bat chokes, it's from guys who finish from knee on belly or mount or something like that. Or at least they start the choke there and then work their way around, uh, you know, doing it from side control. But he caught Clark Gracie with it. And he, caught, he caught Zach Maxwell with it, I think, in the same tournament. Um, you know, it's unheard of getting a baseball bat choke from side control, but it's never going to work again. You know what I mean? Or at least not on those two guys. Um, that's just not, at the end of the day, you're not going to win against the best guys doing things like that. So it's fun that you have it in your back pocket, but it doesn't have anything to do with, you know, um, the keys to passing, the keys to pressure, the keys to holding position in side control, the keys to moving around with somebody, the keys to um, going side to side to, and, and controlling their hip uh, as they try to turtle or as they turn, how to sink the hook in, all those basic details. Um, Issa had them tenfold and anyway, we finishing sequence had him with a rear naked choke couldn't quite get it so he had the i think it was the body triangle if i'm not mistaken which he was cranking his hips in while getting his neck turned so his neck was like crunching in on itself plus his jaw was probably going to feel like it was breaking and so he tapped so great win by leandro isa sasaki i i don't know plus early on he was getting tagged because he was so lanky and upright I think if you're lanky and you're going to be upright, you got to be like John Jones where you really manage your distance. If you're going to get in there and start slugging with guys in MMA, you're going to get lit up. Uh, Hakran Diaz uh, defeated Darren Elkins. Darren Elkins lived by the sword, died by the sword. Looks like he's been dying by it recently. Had a better third round, first two rounds. Couldn't do much against Hakran Diaz, who won. Uh, next one really caught my attention. Hanato Moikano taking on uh, Tom Ninamaki. He defeated Ninamaki with a rear naked choke, second round at 330 mark. Ninamaki did not look bad in this fight at all. Had a good jab going, good movement going. Um, but the problem was he never could really establish his own range. You could see him getting in, and he would kind of slightly connect with Moikano. And as he was getting out, Moikano would just 
it would tear him to pieces. Um, great combinations going side to side from Moicano, left uh, middle kick, right high kick, then coming down with a left hand. You know, great, great stuff going side to side, uh, arm to leg, up and down. Really, really impressed by him. The finishing sequence was just incredible. Um, you had, I'm trying to remember exactly what happened here. You had, uh, oh, you had Nianamaki with a deep underhook trying to sit up, but he didn't get his hips back in time. And so where are his hips? His hips are underneath him, basically. So what does Moikana do? Just drives his own hips forward and takes him out. And uh, I think from there, Nianamaki rolled, and he got also body triangled and then put away. Something like that. I think that's exactly. I think that's close to what happened. It was a rear naked choke finish clean, not a neck crank like it was in the Sasaki bout. Moikano, keep your eye on that kid. I thought the way he drove his hips in there and took advantage of the situation just showed, you know, not just situational awareness, but, um, you know, this is a guy who spent some time on some mats before. Now, that was not a new position to him. And and the finishing instinct there I thought was really good. Ninamaki didn't look bad, you know. This is not. One of the situations where I was like, well, he didn't show up this time. I thought he had a lot going for him. He couldn't quite overcome some of the the diff, the, 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 the lankiness, for lack of a better description, of Moicano. Um, but he didn't look, you know, he had a good jab to the body going, a good, a good overall jab going, good footwork going. Um, he was staying on his toes. He looked like he was in great shape. I, he, just, he just got beat. That's one of those times he just got beat. Uh, Marcos Rogerio de Lima defeated Igor Pokryk via, via TKO punches. First round, 159. This has to be the end for uh, Igor Pokryk. Uh, had, had a lengthy layoff, came back. I think he's dropped four in a row now, if not more than that. Um, you know, what's to say about Rogerio de Lima? He was getting backed up into the fence. So in some ways, you can say that Pokryk had the right idea. But, you know, once you back someone into the fence, you got to do something that changes the phase of the game or you have to back away again and then keep them there as you methodically pick away at them. If you back them into the fence, that's fine, but then you can't stand there and brawl with them, which is what he did. And, of course, he paid for Rogerio de Lima. Rogerio de Lima, you know, bombed on him, basically, and connected with him on a couple of punches, sent him face down, and he got finished from there. Uh, 159 to the first round. It didn't last long. So, like, Prokryk had the right idea about backing this guy up, but if you're going to back him up, even backing up, he still packed a wallop, and he put him down, and it's unfortunate for Prokryk, but, you know, he just probably doesn't deserve to be competing at this level anymore. So that was the prelim card. Um, not bad for it, you know, a prelim card or for what it is. Um, we moved to the main card. The first fight in the main card was crazy. Daniel Serafian taking on Antonio Dos Santos Jr. They call him Junior Alpha. It gets stopped in the second round due to injury, uh, which we'll talk about in a minute, about one minute and one second into the second round. Let me say a couple things about this match that I really thought was crazy. First of all, um, I thought Dos Santos Jr. looked good in terms of his speed. I thought his hand speed looked good. I thought his power looked pretty crazy. I was a little surprised he was standing in front of Serafi, and I thought he, in other matches he's shown, I'm not saying incredible side-to-side -side movement, but maybe more than that. So we didn't see a lot on that. I was a little disappointed in that regard, but um, there was one moment, and maybe you won't appreciate this, but maybe you will. There was one moment where I think, it, oh, Serafian hit him with the head kick, but then ate a right hand as a result. So he hit him with a check hook, and Serafian gets dropped. Now, not too badly, but he gets dropped, okay? So what does Serafian do uh, in the scramble? He actually pulled deep half. Uh, this was – this was – this was – I've never seen anything like this. I've never seen someone try this in deep half before, but it worked. Uh, so Serafian is in deep half, which means the right leg of Dos Santos Jr. is right here. He's got his arm wrapped over it. Head in the hip, okay? Normally what you do with deep half, if this is the arm wrapping over, this hand actually goes under their leg. Now, I know that sounds crazy, but that's normally what you do. And the reason why is if you don't have – because, one, you'll need this arm later. But for the time being, as you're sitting in that position, this arm, this is their leg. If the microphone's their leg, you actually tuck it under their leg while you hold this. And the reason why is because you can get arm barred or kimura from here if you're not careful. This arm can get pulled out, and you can get you just you're basically defenseless. So you tuck it in, and then you hold it there. You can either grab your own gi if it's gi, but even if you're not, if you just you know cinch your elbow down, whatever. Okay, Serafian got beat. He got beat in that position. And if you go back, Dos Santos Jr. had a deep underhook on this arm that's supposed to be tucked. I've never seen anything like this, man. This is a he-man move. Serafian says, "Well, screw it. 
takes this hand and drives it into the chin of Dos Santos, which he then uses to turn over and get his base. I had never seen anything like that in my life, and I'm not prepared to try it because I'm not sure what the details of it are to make it work. I don't know if he improv that or that's a fail-safe move. Uh, I've never seen that. I've never seen that. Now, of course, you know, I don't, I'm not an expert by any stretch of imagination, but I've seen deep half a lot. I've, ne I've never seen someone who lost the underhook battle, you know, he didn't put it down here or keep fighting. He just pulled the hand up here, drove it into the chin, like drove it hard into the chin. Like his head was getting pushed back and then used it to whip around uh, as like a, as like a fulcrum, you know? That was crazy. Uh, in the second round, though, what happened? They were exchanging, and as the in the course of one of the uh, the exchanges, the hand on the tips of the fingers, I think it was the third finger or the second finger, which one of the two, it caught the head of Serafian. It caught the top of Serafian's head, pushing the uh, finger out of joint. Dos Santos calls time, which, of course, you cannot do, and clicks it back into place and then wants to compete again. Referee noticing this waves it off. So it's, he lost. I don't know if he would have won or lost about. I don't, I don't know. Uh, it was pretty competitive for the most part, I'd say. But uh, I thought, you know, definitely looked good enough to deserve another shot in the UFC and see what he can do. Serafian looked better than I thought he was going to look for all intents and purposes. Um, anyway, uh, but I just, I'd never seen that from Deep Half before. That was crazy. I'm, I'm going to go back and watch that again because I want to see exactly, like, how did he do that? Such a risk putting your arm out like that when the real way you do it is you tuck it here. Uh Crazy. But Daniel Serafian wins, so congrats to him. Uh, Eric Silva defeated Mike Rhodes via arm triangle choke in 1 minute and 15 seconds into the first round. Let me say something about this. First of all, I don't know what Mike Rhodes was doing. I know uh, Patrick Wyman has made some complaints that he thought Rhodes, being a better prospect than he is, um, deserved different kind of matchmaking. I, I, you know, I can't speak to that being true or false. I, I have to talk more about Patrick in terms of what his um, actual complaint is. But let me just talk about the ending sequence here. Here's another submission you should pay attention to because this was crazy as well. I don't know if anybody noticed it. I never saw any commentary about it. So, uh, first of all, Mike Rhodes pulls guillotine, and I don't know why because he's sitting up, which you're not going to get. You got to be for that kind of guillotine that he had that arm in, you got to be on the hip where you're doing it to get the kind of proper crank. And he, he wasn't doing that. So, he was just, just sitting up. You're not going to be able to finish anyone sitting up on it. Um, so, that was a problem. Of course, what is. Silva do. Silva gets the left side of Rhodes to go flat against the mat, which you never want to happen. If your leg is flat against the mat, you're about to get passed, bro. That's about that's that's about what's going to happen. Either one side or the other, but you're going to get passed. And of course, knee cuts right through, passes. And then um in an exchange, he locks up the right arm of Rhodes and uses the head and triangle, jumps from mount basically to the other side like all the way through, which is just bad. If you're getting past that way, like he didn't fight through mount and he didn't fight to get to the other side either. Like he just sort of crossed all the way. Um, not a strong showing off of his back from Rhodes. But the funny part to me is when you go back and watch the submission, uh, and I'm not critiquing it. I actually thought this was a new twist. There's a moment where Silva has it. Now, when Silva gets it, the Rhodes did one of the one of the um, the, the classic defenses, which is where uh, you know you bring up your leg um, and you try and use as you as you hook around, you try and use that spot to open up. It, it didn't work. So the defense he tried, but you know it's a last ditch defense. It's not always going to work. It's almost never going to work. Sometimes it'll work, but not if someone has it on tight. And that was the point. Forget the defense that Rhodes had. Uh, the craziness to me was that when you normally do that submission, so if their arm is here, their arm is here, right? And I'm coming around. This side is like the cross face into their neck. Their arm is by my neck here, right? So they're, they're over here. I'm on, I'm, my body is on the, like their bodies are here. Mine's on the other side of it. So my right is to their left. My right is to the right. I'm sorry. Um, when you do that, you normally want this elbow on the, on the ground flat. Now, you don't have to, obviously. You go back and watch like Shane Carwin versus uh, Brock Lesnar. You know, he just horsepowered that uh, to the point where he didn't have to do it. But I'm just saying you normally want that. He didn't have that at all, at all. In fact, it was way off the ground. But that was the crazy point. Because, like, the reason why you want to fly on the ground is so you can have their back and, and their shoulders flat on the mat. Silva said, screw it. He not only had his shoulders off the mat, he had his shoulders and neck off the mat and turned. 
So I'm not saying it was partly a crank. It, it may have been. I'm not sure. But if you get a chance, go back and look at it because his shoulder and his head are not in alignment. <laughs> They're not in alignment at all. Normally you see a guy just get flattened. He's all the way here. The pressure's coming down. They're they're changing the angle at a 45-degree angle to make it tight, 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 and then they tap. No, no, no. His joint was like this. Like he was getting squeezed off the mat hard, man. Eric Silva was putting on the anaconda, not the choke, but, bro, that was – that was he must have put the death squeeze on Mike Rhodes for his whole neck and shoulders to be out of alignment for that choke. That is nuts. Uh, Rashid Magomedov defeated Elias Silverio. Great showing for Magomedov on a lot of things, but I still – I need to see more from him. He's very patient. He figures guys out. He does everything well. I just need to see more of him. First of all, the inside trip he hit at the first round was like textbook beautiful. Again, a guy when he's striking goes side to side, up and down, changes attacks. Um, never lets you get away with something. If you hit him with a leg shot, he's coming with a check hook. Uh, great jab, good footwork, doesn't get tired. A real economy of motion around Rashid Magomedov. Lots to like about him. Offensive output, though, is a little bit low. Now, he did wind up putting Silverio away in the third round, barely. It was The time was 4 minutes and 57 seconds via TKO. Um, but he got it, hit him clean. It was fine. I, again, he, he does a lot well. It's just that he lets guys hang around in fights a little too long for my taste. And against the better guys, that's probably going to cost him a round or two. Um, good takedown defense. Uh, um, good chin, too, because he got hit with a couple of hard shots, particularly on that left eye of his, and was able to not wear damage particularly poorly or um, you know have it affect his uh, uh, ability to compete. So, um, so that was good. Um, but I just, if I had a critique of him, it's not that he, I mean, he, he brilliantly uses his energy. He is technical everywhere. Uh, doesn't take a lot of damage, but I need to see him turn it up a notch. I need to see another level of that before I'm really being able to, before I can really sit here and tell you, yeah, this is the guy, you know, this, this is the guy, this is the one that's going to do it. I, I can't quite commit to that yet, but by all means, not a bad win. Trust me, a great win. Uh, Patrick Cummins. Defeated Antonio Carlos Jr., 30-27, uh, 30-27, 30-27. In the end of the third round, uh, Antonio Carlos Jr. took Cubbins' back and was, you know, desperate for a finish and couldn't get it, but there was just not enough time. Something like, you know, 20 or 30 seconds. I think I have a soda here. I do. Um, caffeine. Cummins looked good, man. He looked really good. Um Able to get the takedown whenever he needed it. Able to pass whenever he needed it. Um, able to, you know, he's not really threatening submissions. So um, there wasn't a lot to speak of on that level. But, and he doesn't like grind you where he's constantly pounding on you. But there's a steady Chinese water torture raindrop of punches where you can never get comfortable, never catch your breath. You know, it's kind of interesting to me. I would want to see more of the jiu-jitsu of Antonio Carlos Jr. And here's why. Because if you notice how he was defending Cummins, he never was really pulling around the neck or getting an overhook around the arm. You know, he was doing wrist control with like a knee shield. And a knee shield is where I have, let's say I have my right leg around your right leg, like in a half guard, and I've got my left leg covering your hip or maybe your shoulder. And maybe my right leg is like covering your far side hip. So like a hip and then a shoulder, a hip and a hip, almost like a butterfly. Let's say hip and shoulder, um, just to be clear. That's like a knee shield kind of position. It's like a half guard thing. There's different ways to do knee shield, but you get the idea. And then he was like holding his wrists where there's this huge gap in between. And so what was happening? Cummins was breaking wrist control and then bombing on him. And he kept doing it. Um, partly that was initially that worked out for him. That space enabled Antonio Carlos Jr. to go for leg locks in the first round. But, you know, just it just wasn't the right kind of guard for MMA. I think you need to have guys, you know, arm bars are a little more common in MMA not just because, you know, they're easier to get when you have punches to set them up, but also, you know, I if your posture is perfectly straight and I'm on my back, I can't get an arm bar. You know, my arm is here. You're, there's not enough leverage for it. You need me. You need my posture bent over and then my arm pulled across your body. That's what you need. Um, and so that's one reason why MMAs are a little more prevalent in uh, or uh, arm bars a little more prevalent in MMA. And so that one reason is that you're already got them on the neck and the arm to control so you're not getting plastered. 
right, with punches. And now that you're here, let's work some submissions from here. Triangles, arm bars, I'm going to us, all right? So there's that. Um, go back and look at how Cummins defended the leg locks. Always putting pressure down before he turned. Always making sure that he never straightened the leg if he had to avoid it. Uh, always making sure that he sat. And if there's pressure down on your ankle, if your ankle's being driven to the mat, it can't be lifted. And you need that lift to get that heel hook. You need that lift to get that knee bar, um, or at least that initial attack on the knee bar, the initial attack on the heel. If you're driving your weight down, not a lot they can do with it. So good way by Patrick Cummings. Uh, Hennem Barrow defeated Mitch Gagnon via arm triangle choke, third round at 353. Go back and watch that head and arm triangle. Barrow's arm almost touching the mat, like just a, maybe a half an inch off. A l- more of your traditional finish in that regard. Um, people are saying, you know, I didn't watch this fight live and I went back and watched it. People were like, well, Barrow didn't look like himself. Uh, I disagree. I disagree. Barrow is a guy who's had some fights where he goes there and blows the doors off of you like he did with John Pickett or excuse me, Brad Pickett. But then there's fights where he goes the distance with people he was much better than like in Scott Jorgensen's case. Credit to Mitch Gagnon. Mitch Gagnon looked like he was a more of a natural for the weight class in terms of the size. B faster. C, I think very strong. And three, I think he went in there and said, if I'm going to lose, I'm going to lose, but I'm not going to go in there and lose because I let someone else dictate the offense. Gagnon was in there getting after it the whole time, constantly attacking him. And maybe he didn't get that far with it. And by the third round, he was exhausted and just holding Barrow against the cage. But Barrow dropped him in that first round, had his moments in the second, and then the third, uh, uh, getting behind him with the tight waist. Um, and then initially trying to set up the head and arm, it gets defended and then goes right back to it and finishes it off. So, um, you know, Gagnon was exhausted by the time that Barrow did it and and Barrow, the, 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 the bout wasn't in question before then. So, you know, I, I, I people were like, oh, Barrow didn't look that good. I mean, I'm not saying he went in there and looked amazing, but I, did, I, I was expecting him to go look poor or languid or slow. That's not what I saw. I saw a guy in Gagnon really aggressively trying to attack and, and maybe ran out of options and was kind of stalling towards the end, but just was like, the brain was like, go, 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 go. Don't let him get off first. You get in there and box. You get in there and brawl. You get in there and exchange. You get in there and do something to make it happen. And, uh, you know, I was winning a lot of the underhook battles. How many times did Hennon Barrow have to fight out of double underhooks, you know? So uh, I, I disagree pretty vehemently that Barrow looked bad. And then last but not least, what do you say? Leota Machida beating C.B. Dalloway by with just an insane liver kick and a follow-up series of punches. The end came at one minute and two seconds into the first round. Leota Machida just looked incredible. Uh, but, you know, I kind of felt like this is what it was expected to happen. I think the major takeaway is at 35 years old, Machida is definitely still an A-class competitor uh, and is definitely still a title contender. So what, what happened? They exchanged a little bit, uh, not much, kind of feeling each other out. Machida does what he does. Um, CB Dalloway pawing with a jab and some leg kicks. And then you can see Dalloway again, expecting uh, a head kick or some kind of upstairs, you know, buzz the tower sort of top gun thing. And it came in right under the ribs. CB Dalloway winces in pain and Machida, who was a brilliant finisher, went and, and put him away from there. Uh, people were calling for Machida versus Rockhold, which I think would be a great idea. I'm all in favor of it. Um, not a lot to say because, this is what you kind of expected to happen. I feel bad for CB Dalloway, who I think re- his resume is deeply underrated. I thought he beat Tim Boach and should have deserved that win. Um, you know, and then if he went back and fought Mark Munoz, I'd favor him to beat Mark Munoz at this point. But uh, what are you going to do? What are you going to do? But Machida wins, and looks like he will face, um, I think, uh, Luke, Luke Rockhold next. Performance of the night, Leota Machida, Hendon Barrow, Eric Silva, and Vitor Miranda. Uh, there was no fight of the night awarded. That's kind of strange. And I don't have any attendance figures for you just yet. Quickly, uh, grapple at the Garden results. Uh, as far as MMA is concerned, uh, King Mo defeated Hollis Gracie over uh, a decision 15 points to six. By the way, they weren't wearing singlets at uh, Grapple at the Garden. They were wearing um, team rash guard uniforms. So each one had like the like the biker shorts and then the short sleeve rash guard, and they were like modeled on team uniforms. I actually thought it looked kind of cool. Might look better than the single. That, that's something that they – I know that Fila was for a time considering doing away with the singlet. I mean, maybe they still are. I don't know. But doing away with the singlet in favor of some kind of cosmetic change to make wrestling more appealing. And you may think it's a dumb argument. I'm just trying to say that's what they were considering for a time. And uh, the folks who grappled the garden gave it a run, and I think it worked for whatever that's worth. Brennan Ward uh, just, you know, munished Igor Gracie. Uh, Gray Maynard, 
crushed. I always have trouble with this guy's name. Ozzy Dugul Ub Gov. He's a World Series of Fighting guy. Um, and Gray Maynard had his way with him. Jordan Oliver, tech falling. Frank Molinaro. I, Frank Molinaro's had a rough go of it. He's grappled the gardens. I think it was Bubba Jenkins who beat him last time and then stood over him, you know. Um, and Jordan Oliver just tech falled him, so that was bad. Sean Bunch defeated Demacio Page, also via tech fall. Sean Bunch, I think from a front headlock, did a gator roll or a, a gut wrench. I have to go back and watch. I'm not sure which one it was. But exposed him for back points and then gets up and calls timeout and then takes a selfie and then goes back and then tech falls Demacio Page. So that was embarrassing. Uh, Joe Warren defeated Scott Jorgensen twice. Um, pinned him once and then uh, I think tech falled him the second time. But anyway, the first time... Uh, got double underhooks on him, picked him up, dropped him, and then pinned him within like a minute or something like that. It was it was brutal. Uh, and then of course, uh, Peter Kin uh, defeated a boss. Uh, Tervel Delagnev lost to Kajimura at Gatsalov. Gatsalov is the guy who famously kept Daniel Cormier from advancing in the Olympics, uh, a, a world champion, um, many times over. I think an Olympic champion as well. Um, Delagnev had, I'm told, had beaten him earlier this year and then lost 7-4 to four at Grapple at the Garden. And then last but not least, uh, a very surprising result, and again, I also have trouble with this guy's name, Jofala Kant Kayan, uh, the Armenian. I can't, and I'm, I can't believe I'm, I'm half Armenian as well. Um, Jolfala Kayan. <laughs> I can't pronounce this, this fool's name at all. Uh, of course, all Armenian names end with Y-A-N or I-A-N. My mother's maiden name was Georgian. But Dake couldn't get it done. Six to three, he lost. Um, Dake's one of these guys where I feel like he does a lot of his points um, when he's able to get behind guys, pick them up, drop them, gut wrench them. Um, still adapting to freestyle rules. I think that he's been competing in lesser tournaments, partly because of injury, but also because still working at his craft as he transitions over. You know, He's the folk style king in college, but I don't think he's quite rounded out his game um at this level all right so that's about 30 minutes i went way too long last time i'm not going to this time i know there were some boxing events i didn't get a chance to watch them uh you know i got a wife at home i can't do everything but going forward in 2015 um i'll be sure to get some kickboxing in there and and boxing as it's relevant and of course um any kind of other combat sports as is relevant as well thank you for watching email me at luke.thomas at sbnation.com i'm going to post this on soundcloud and the promotional law practice live chat uh, iTunes thing, and uh, I'll put this on MMAfighting.com as well for those who missed it. Uh, there will be a live chat. I'm just not sure when, probably tomorrow. And uh, thanks, guys. Bye.